Hello to my dear beloved people of YouTube. If you're like me and find Christian fundamentalism and its impacts fascinating, you will really enjoy this case. I do want to give a quick trigger warning before we jump into this case. This case involves CA, it involves neglect, it involves religion and murder. Within the bubble of Christian fundamentalism, ministers and leaders started urging their members and the families to adopt. If you know anything about Christian fundamentalism, you know that they want control. They want every family to have as many children as possible. If you can't biologically produce children, adopt. They want big families because numbers equal control, essentially. If you have watched the recent Duggar documentary, you know this. You know how the Christian fundamentalists roll, okay? That is what's happening in this case. We need a little bit of context before we jump into the actual people involved so y'all will have an idea of what's going on. A specific ministry called Above Rubies played a very significant role in the 2000s adoption boom. Remember the name of that ministry. They promoted the adoption of African children specifically, emphasizing the religious duty of welcoming these poor off children into their homes. They even went as far as equating it to welcoming Jesus himself. So within this community that already prioritizes large families too big for adoption, they specifically promoted adopting older and disabled children. It's because these children were seen as less desired and made the people adopting them seem more godly, more holy. They're adopting the kids that nobody wants to adopt. While disabled and older children do need adoption, the challenges arise whenever children are expected to seamlessly integrate into these large homeschooling Christian fundamentalist families. The mix of adoption, disability, homeschool, religion, cultural difference, isolation. It's just a huge, huge recipe for abuse, neglect, and in this case, homicide. Ethiopia in particular became a prominent sending country for adoption, largely due to the efforts of this Christian community and adoption agencies. Although older and disabled children should absolutely be adopted, it should be done ethically, not in a way that benefits everyone besides the children. That pretty much is the context that leads us perfectly into today's story. Hannah Williams was born in Ethiopia in 1997. She faced a very, very difficult life before adoption. After losing her father and her mother disappearing, she lived with extended family until poverty forced them to give her up for adoption. Throughout her very traumatic journey, she developed PTSD, which is very common in these orphanages with children who had gone through very traumatic upbringings. Her early life was was marked with a lot of hardship, but at this orphanage, she saw people getting adopted by families and it gave her hope for a better future. That's where Larry and Carrie Williams come into this story. They are a couple from Cedro Woolley, Washington. I don't know if I'm saying that right. They're a Christian fundamentalist family. They're all about homeschool, okay? They have eight biological children. They are like the Duggars. They're like everyone else in the fundamentalist church. They are homeschooling their children. They are basically creating a little cult. Clearly, this family has a huge responsibility of homeschooling eight children. They have no business adopting whatsoever. I am confident that most people in this world do not have the financial stability to adopt on top of eight children. Regardless, a friend of Carrie's testified that Carrie wanted more children, but could no longer conceive them naturally. This is when the couple went on an above rubies, remember the ministry from before, woman's retreat, where Carrie was all of the sudden inspired to adopt from Ethiopia. What? Let's dive into above rubies a little bit more. They are a self-proclaimed ministry that's purpose is, and I quote, to encourage women in their high calling as wives, mothers, and homemakers. Its purpose is to uphold and strengthen family life and to raise the standard of God's truth in the nation. In 2008, the couple got in contact with an adoption agency called Adoption Advocates International or AAI. I saw this all of the time growing up. I can remember being an 11 year old getting handed a 
picture of an African child trying to convince me to convince my parents to adopt, which is crazy. There is no concern for the ethics. There's no concern for the quality of life that that child will be getting. It's just about the appearance. It's just about making yourself feel godly. The agency originally matched a little deaf boy that went by the name of Emmanuel to this couple, as Carrie apparently knew sign language. Because the couple seems so willing and ready to adopt, the agency wanted to try its luck and get the rare double adoption. That's whenever they sent over the one minute video of Hannah. When the couple saw this one minute video of Hannah, they apparently immediately fell in love with her and had to have her. That's whenever this adoption agency sent the Williams over a one minute video of 10 year old Hannah. Hannah was located at the same orphanage as Emmanuel and whenever the couple saw the video of Hannah, they immediately fell in love with her, apparently. This is whenever the adoption process began. They wanted to adopt Hannah and Emmanuel. However, the process was riddled with lies and deceit. Social workers had basically tried to gauge how qualified Larry and Carrie were to adopt. They just lied about everything pretty much just because Carrie knew sign language a little bit. Didn't really mean that she could teach a child that is from a country speaking another language sign language. It doesn't mean that she is trained or equipped to do that. It honestly doesn't even mean that she's trained to communicate with the child as is. Not only that, Larry and Carrie were heavily, heavily influenced by a very controversial book that you may have heard of called To Train Up a Child. To Train Up a Child is a book by Michael and Debbie Pearl, which advocates for severe disciplinary measures to shape a child's behavior. The idea behind this book is basically Beat the rebellious spirit out of the child and then you will have a good child. It's basically brainwashing. The idea behind this book is literally to beat a child until they don't have a personality, until they don't have a will, until they've lost the zest for life. It's insane that this book is still used to this day. Regardless, whenever the adoption agency asked Larry and Carrie if they punished their children by hitting them, they of course said no. We have never hit our children. We would never do such a thing. A lie. But they knew if they told the social workers that, yeah, we actually do beat the will to live out of our children, they wouldn't be able to adopt. Larry and Carrie didn't even put in effort to travel to Ethiopia before adopting. Instead, they arranged for Hannah and Emmanuel to be escorted to Washington State. This is a practice that has now been banned by the Ethiopian government as a way to prevent the mistreatment of adopted children. One of the detrimental aspects of this method is the parents aren't even putting in the effort to get to know the child's heritage, the child's culture, which is obviously a huge part of that child. That's going to be a way you understand the child. That's going to be a way that you're able to bond with that child, which is essential for connecting with them. But no, 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 no. That is not what the 2000s Christian adoption boom was about. The Christian adoption boom was not about cultural understanding and unconditional love. It was about the gentrification of humans. These adoptions were about taking disadvantaged colored children, bringing them into a white American household and changing them for the better so that you will feel godly, so that you will feel holy. The adoption process went through. Unfortunately, Hannah and Emmanuel found themselves within the gated community in Washington with eight other children. On the outside, completely out of context, this may sound like an amazing blessing. These poor children that come from third world countries are now brought into these rich, gated communities that focus on homeschooling their children and, and religious values and, and complete isolation from the outside world. In reality, that just creates a perfect environment for abuse. And sure enough, that is exactly what happened. After the newness, 
process of the adoption process wearing off, the Williams quickly realized that adding two new children to an already large family wasn't as easy as they thought it would be. These were real children with real trauma, personalized physical and emotional needs, and cultural differences. They weren't just the simple and glamorous religious accessories that they had so desperately hoped they would be. These aren't objects, they're not social statuses, and they're not tickets to heaven. These are children who deserve human rights, which is very, very difficult for the Christian fundamentalist community to understand. I digress. Sure enough, Hannah and Emmanuel were singled out from the rest of the children, and they were subjected to very harsh and extreme punishments. Hannah specifically was targeted whenever she first moved in to the household, she was allowed to sleep with her sisters, but she was deprived of food. So whenever Carrie caught Hannah stealing food, she basically became a target for Carrie's anger. She now saw Hannah as a disobedient child, and we know what they do with disobedient child. Beat them until they become obedient. So because Hannah was caught stealing from the pantry, which these white rich parents could not figure out why this Ethiopian girl that comes from an orphanage would think to steal. It has nothing to do with her hard life before. They didn't go out there. They didn't care to see what kind of condition she lived in before or even think what could be causing this behavior. Are we not feeding her enough? They didn't see it like that. They saw Hannah now as a rebellious child and decided she needed to be punished. How does she need to be punished? Well, let's take away her house. Let's take away her human rights, right? Carrie then decided to put Hannah in a barn and force her to live in a barn now that's 80 feet away from the house. Shortly after this, Hannah actually started her period, which especially enraged Carrie. Not only was Carrie mad because, and I quote, she had expected to adopt a little girl, not a half-grown woman. She was mad because Hannah actually had hepatitis B. This is a little girl who has never had her period before. She gets her period and doesn't know what to do. She didn't get sex education. She doesn't know what to do with this. And blood ends up getting smeared in one way or another in the bathroom. Carrie then takes this and claims that Hannah is trying to infect all of the other children. So now Hannah is only allowed to use an outhouse outside that only got cleaned once a year, if that. Not only is she forced to use that outhouse, which none of the other children used, she was forced to bathe outside with a cold cold water hose propped up by sticks. Keep in mind, this is Washington state. It's cold. And no matter the weather conditions, Hannah was forced to bathe with a cold water hose. And she would sometimes get the privilege of using a towel to dry off. This barn that Hannah stayed in, eventually Carrie got old of that and decided to lock her in a small dark shower room. And after she felt like this wasn't enough punishment, she moved her to a small, four by two closet where Hannah spent almost 24 hours a day in. Not only that, while she was in it, almost exclusively music and Bible sermons were blasted from outside of the door. The reason being, according to the other siblings, is because Carrie wanted to change the way that Hannah thought. She was rebellious and she needed to listen to these Bible sermons so that she could change who she was. Again, this is a preteen from a completely different country, a completely different culture. She just started her period. She's confused. All of this is being called rebellion by Carrie and Larry. Carrie would often complain about how rebellious Hannah was and how much she disliked Hannah to a knitting group that she went to frequently. And the knitting group actually recommended, why don't you think about rehoming her? Why don't you contact the adoption agency? But she refused this saying, and I quote, I don't wish her on anyone. She told the group that her and Larry already had plans of legally changing her age to 16 so that they could kick her out. Whenever the group rightfully expressed concern for her safety, how is she going to live? Carrie said, and I quote, not my problem. 
the one thing that made Hannah happy, the one thing that she had that was truly hers was her hair. She really loved her hair and she felt like she could express herself through it. It was comforting to her. Once Carrie saw that Hannah loved her hair, she decided to use it as a punishment tactic. One day whenever Hannah apparently cut the grass too short, Carrie then cut all of Hannah's hair off. This is so psychologically, physically, and emotionally torturous. Both Hannah and Emmanuel were excluded from family mills. They were typically forced to eat outside, again, even if it's harsh, snowy Washington weather. They weren't given warm meals. They were typically given cold leftovers with frozen vegetables put on top. And if they had the lucky chance of getting a sandwich, the parents would make sure to soak the bread in water before they gave it to the children. Just straight up abusive because they want to. According to law enforcement, Hannah specifically was denied homeschooling, although they tried to make it seem like they were homeschooling her. There was one specific Christmas where Emmanuel and Larry had gotten into some sort of conflict. As much conflict as a grown man can have with a deaf eight-year-old boy. Regardless, Larry ended up beating Emmanuel so hard that he started to bleed from his face. From that moment on, Hannah and Emmanuel weren't allowed to celebrate their birthdays. They weren't allowed to be a part of Christmas or anything along those lines. They both endured physical discipline involving different tools such as belts, a flexible glue stick, and even a plastic plumbing tube that Carrie always kept in her bra. And they would get punished for anything. They would literally get punished if they were standing wrong. Although their biological children got punished as well and spanked quite a bit, it was nowhere near the adopted children. Emmanuel's deaf, right? A lot of times deaf people hear through vibrations. And so Emmanuel a lot of times would hear with his feet. Once the parents picked up on that, they started to beat Emmanuel's feet. They started to get a switch and beat the soles of his feet. They would sometimes even get the switch and strike Emmanuel's face, which Carrie later testified in court was just a joke. I don't think any sane person would find that funny. They would specifically prevent deaf members from the church that they went to from interacting with Emmanuel. There are several instances where the deaf members of that church would try to have a conversation with him and Larry or Carrie would quickly grab him and walk away. Emmanuel was specifically isolated and singled out if they were mad at him. They would forbid all of the other children from communicating with Emmanuel. They would say sign language isn't allowed in the house right now, which left Emmanuel completely isolated. He had literally no one to talk to and no way to talk to them. Their neighbors even noticed the exclusion of these adopted children. They noticed how Hannah would not be at family activities or events. They noticed that whenever the family went for walks, Hannah would often linger way behind. And whenever the other children were playing in the yard, Hannah would often stay at the edge of the driveway. According to Hannah's adopted siblings, no one liked Hannah, but it didn't really matter because she was always in the closet. The siblings also testified that Hannah's cries slowly, slowly, and slowly started to get softer due to the repeated spankings. Hannah and Emmanuel's adoption was something that was supposed to be life-giving, life-renewing, quickly turned into a nightmare I don't think a single one of us could imagine. May 11th, 2011 began as any normal day in the Williams household. The children woke up, came out of their bedrooms for homeschool time, Carrie went and unlocked Hannah out of the closet, and then the parents started to make breakfast. Hannah ate her breakfast outside. The children then went outside to play a fun game of capture the flag, to which Hannah did not participate participate in, and Larry left for work around noon. The children ate lunch around two or three, and Carrie escorted Hannah to the outhouse before lunch. She then gave Hannah her wet sandwich and forced her to eat outside for her disobedience. Hannah was required to stay outside that entire day for punishment. There is also a rumor slash testimony reported that when Hannah was on her period, Carrie would not let her inside, and apparently Hannah was spotting this day. As the day becomes night, Hannah is still outside alone in her t-shirt and cut off sweatpants. Reminder, it's May. It is spring in Washington and this is a girl from a warm climate. Whenever Hannah complained that she was cold, Carrie responded with, you need
need to exercise then. Hannah was then forced to do jumping jacks and other exercises in order to maintain body heat. She would do these exercises for about a minute and then she would be so fatigued that she couldn't go on. At some point it started to drizzle outside. Carrie tried to make Hannah come inside but Hannah refused, rightfully so. Those are abusers. And this is whenever Carrie escorted Hannah to an outhouse around 8.30. But this time, Carrie claims that Hannah was throwing herself on the ground. She testified that Hannah did this a few times after using the outhouse. She also admitted that she didn't help Hannah in any way get up from these falls because, quote, I didn't need to. She got right back up herself. Carrie also saw Hannah repeatedly hit her forehead on the back patio. And at one point, Carrie left Hannah alone outside because she couldn't watch it anymore. Carrie then went inside and that's whenever the entire rest of the family joined in to watch this child thrash around in misery and pain. Emmanuel even said that some of the family members were laughing. She sent out two of the sons to spank Hannah because this behavior was apparently a seeking and rebellious and force Hannah to do exercises to which she would start and then she would stop because she didn't have the energy to do them. Carrie then claims that she brought Hannah her dinner outside and that Hannah put the food on the fork and she brought it to her mouth. She would kind of just fall over and not eat anything. About five minutes in, Carrie took the dinner, went inside, came out a little bit after and tried to get Hannah to come inside and this is whenever Hannah went limp. She then ordered her two oldest sons to go outside, remove Hannah's muddy bloody socks from her so that she wouldn't, you know, get the house dirty and um, bring Hannah's limp body inside to the house. So they removed her socks and they threw them into a garage. Whenever they came back, Hannah was undressing herself. Whenever Carrie went outside and saw that Hannah was naked from the waist down, she told her sons to go back inside and not to worry about it because quote, modesty is important in our family. She then went back inside, brought Hannah out some dry clothes and left them at her feet just to change. She then left for a bit. She sent one of her children to go check on Hannah every 10 to 15 minutes and the child reported every single time that they would check on Hannah, Hannah would have another article of clothing removed from her body until she was completely naked. After Hannah was completely undressed and limped, she remained outside in the dark, bloody, wet, cold environment for at least another hour or two. Carrie then called Larry to discuss if this was an attention grabbing attempt from Hannah, if Hannah was being rebellious, just trying to figure out what was Hannah's intent in dying pretty much. And apparently Larry was not surprised or shocked at all that this was an attention grabbing technique. These people are so sick. This is whenever the child that they had previously sent to check on Hannah went outside to check once again and she found Hannah with her face halfway on the concrete and halfway on the grass. Her mouth was full of blood and dirt and Hannah was cold to the touch. Carrie then came outside to see Hannah's limp naked body and because she was disgusted by Hannah's unmodesty, she went inside to get a sheet, came back and placed the sheet over Hannah. Carrie then made one of the most disgusting, evil 911 phone calls I have ever ever heard. And I'm going to play this for y'all just so y'all can hear how much of a monster this woman is. What is your emergency? Yes, um, I think my daughter just killed herself. Why do you say that? Um, she's really rebellious and she's been outside refusing to come in and she's been throwing herself all around and then she collapsed. As Carrie's voice became annoyed over that 911 call, she was describing how she had been passive aggressive and just causing them so much stress. What Hannah was experiencing was called paradoxical undressing, and it happens with 20 to 50% of hypothermia deaths. I don't think they specifically know what caused it, but a theory is your blood vessels expand, which causes a lot of blood to go to the blood vessels, which then makes your body feel like it's literally burning. The people experiencing this hypothermia then start to frantically remove their clothing to try to give them some sort of relief. That 
obviously makes it even worse and they end up dying. Hannah was declared deceased at the hospital with the cause of death determined to be a combination of hypothermia, malnutrition, and an infection in her intestines. Hannah was between 76 and 80 pounds at the time of her death, which is lighter than 97% of girls her age, which she was, she was 13. The following day, CPS came to the Williams residence and Larry would not let them in. So they called the police and the police forced their way in. A deputy noticed that he was specifically kind of weirded out by how clean the house was. It didn't seem like eight people had lived there. They didn't really seem too impacted by Hannah's death. The children and the parents were just acting like it was just an ordinary occurrence. It was during this police investigation that they found the book to train up a child. Approximately 12 days later, CPS conducted interviews with the children. However, their responses were very scripted and rehearsed. They basically constantly just repeated that Hannah was rebellious. Even some of the children said that she was possessed by a demon. Emmanuel even reported that individuals like Hannah received spankings for lying and would go to hell's fires, which caused Larry to quickly end the interviews with the children. Surprisingly, even after all of this, somehow the Williams were let off free with their children. No child was taken away and no arrests were made. Things went like normal for the next two months until about the middle of July, whenever CPS had gotten an anonymous call that Emmanuel was being treated the same way Hannah was right before Hannah died. As a result, CPS finally thought the situation was important enough to investigate and they started to place all of the children in foster homes. Even though Larry was completely forbidden from talking to the children, he still sent them letters with Bible verses that he would basically encrypt to tell them things. Emmanuel went under intensive therapy and support from Julia Peterson, a specialist working with deaf children. And Julia said that Emmanuel was so disturbed from this experience that even talking about the Williams family gave him severe, severe fear. He was very emotionally confused and he had a habit of excessively apologizing. In fact, whenever he got rehomed to a foster mother, he was surprised whenever she didn't beat him. She, he thought that he should be being beat. He was then diagnosed with PTSD. Brave Brave Emanuel actually testified in court against the Williams family on July 29th. And this is just such an incredible and courageous young boy. This boy was having night terrors that Carrie was climbing through his window, but he still had the bravery to get up in front of all of those people and testify against these horrible monsters. There was three interpreters in the room as Emmanuel tried to share his story. And there was often long, long moments of silence during these few hours Emmanuel was attempting to testify. In his testimony, there was actually this really jarring moment. With his hands thrown up in the air, he signed, I don't know where she is she disappeared. I think maybe she's dead. This was obviously a very, very emotionally impactful testimony. Larry pointed it to Carrie because Carrie was the person overseeing the household's day-to-day -day activity. And Carrie pointed it to Larry because Larry was the head of this patriarchal family dynamic and that she was simply his delegate. Their defense also was that Hannah's age was 16 instead of 13. Carrie specifically could not be charged for one of the charges if she could prove that Hannah was 16 instead of 13. So her defense team spent a large amount of time trying to prove that Hannah was actually older. Because of this, Hannah's body was exhumed from the grave and she was proven to be in fact 13 years old. On September 9th, seven weeks after the trial started, Carrie and Larry were found guilty on almost all of the charges brought against them. First degree assault of Emmanuel, manslaughter of Hannah, and for Carrie, homicide by abuse. On October 29th, they were sentenced. Larry, almost 28 years, and Carrie, almost 37. As Judge Susan Cook handed down these sentences, she said that Hannah came to the land of milk and honey, only to find frozen food and water-soaked sandwiches. Joshua Williams, 
the oldest son of the Williams family, actually wrote a letter to Cook where he basically said, can you please show my parents grace? They didn't know how hard it was to adopt a child and to consider their track record, that they had never hurt a child before and that they are not a harm to the public. Judge Cook saw it differently. She said that the Williams track record was this, one child dead, one with PTSD, and seven that thought that the degrading treatment that the other two endured was acceptable. But the disrespect and the utter disgusting disregard of Hannah did not end there. An Ethiopian community center wanted to install a memorial for Hannah at the orphanage. This is when in October the community members who had spent months following the trial and advocating for Hannah found out that they weren't allowed to make this memorial for Hannah at the adoption center because the Williams had already made one. This memorial read that her birthday was 1994 three years earlier than listed on Hannah's birth certificate. Even after they're sentenced, they get their extended family to, I, I don't even have words, these people have to have the last word even when Hannah's already dead. Hannah's dead, she can't speak for herself and they are still trying to get the last word. In a symbolic way, Hannah's parents who had abused, shunned, and ultimately killed her still had to have the last word on her life. The only truly positive part of the story is Emmanuel is now living with a deaf African-American father foster mother. His signing ability has improved dramatically and according to testimony he is happier than ever. Another positive thing about this case is it shed light on the adoption abuse that was happening within the Christian community. I truly wish the worst on Carrie and Larry. I genuinely don't think there is a big enough sentence for them. I hope that they die a miserable death in prison. I really want to be able to continue to make true crime content and other other content. I'm starting my channel up from nothing so it would really help if you could interact with this video. Thank you for watching. If you see something, say something and stay safe.